Great, we're just waiting for people to file in and we'll get started in just a couple minutes. Great, thank you, Meredith. Okay, great. It looks like we're holding strong um, and people will file in later when, they, when they're ready to come. So welcome everyone. I'm happy to see so many of you with us today. I'm Meredith Fluke. I'm the director of the Cantor Gallery at Holy Cross. And we have invited artist B. Lynch here today to speak with us about her exhibition, New Gilded Age. Currently on view at the Cantor, behind me uh, through February 5th. Just a quick note on format. We are hosting this conversation webinar style. That means that Bridget will be presenting alone, more or less for about 45 minutes. Throughout, I will be asking questions and my colleague Paula Rosenblum and I will be moderating the questions in the Q&A. Um, we'll likely save a lot of those questions to the end unless they seem particularly pressing. So if you have questions, at any point in time, write them into the Q&A um, and we will get to them eventually. Also FYI, this talk is being recorded and it will later be posted on our website, our New Gilded Age specially designated website and you see the address for that here. Um, I hope that you will take a moment to visit the website that we've developed alongside various departments here at Holy Cross. The site includes artworks, installation shots and videos that can help you engage remotely with the exhibition. And we'll continue to update that website throughout the run of the show. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the artist B. Lynch, AKA Bridget. So like myself, Bridget is an East Coast transplant who originally hails from the Midwest. After studying East Asian culture and Japanese theater and performance at the University of Kansas, Bridget then went on to study painting at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts Boston and holds an MFA from Lesley University School of Art and Design. She was a longtime studio art faculty member at Simmons University in Boston, where she also served as the director of the Trustman Gallery. Bridget has mounted solo exhibitions at galleries throughout New England, most recently at the Lamont Gallery at Phillips Exeter and the Gallery at Framingham State University. She's won a number of awards, including an artist grant from the St. Baltoff Club Foundation and an Artist Resource Trust Award from the Berkshire Taconic Foundation. She will be happy to tell you that she has recently made the move to full-time work in the studio. I think it's best for Bridget to talk about her art, um, but we'll say that she has been an interesting artist to work through during this to work with during this particular moment. With her immersive world of reds and grays that are endlessly iterated in various media and through the interaction of these characters, Bridget has created a world that provides layers of commentary on income and power disparity. Like so many great works of art and particularly satire that have come before, the world of new Gilded Age holds a mirror to our own. The intrigue of Bridget's world is the game-like system that she's created that trades in magic and play, but also at the same time allows for a pointed social critique. For me, that seem that these seemingly disparate modes can coexist amplifies Bridget's message and importantly carries the kind of valence that is a really strong suit of the visual arts. For these reasons and myriad others, I'm so pleased that we're, we were able to mount New Gilded Age at the Cantor this fall. So Bridget, Welcome, and thank you for being with us here today. Can you start us off by talking a little bit about your project and how you became interested in working with this theatrical medium? I'd be delighted to, but first I wanna thank you, Meredith, for shepherding this show to where it has gotten. I am so pleased with it and the, the way the, um, college has put so many resources behind the show. And I have to thank Paula 
who has just been so helpful with everything Paula Rosenblum. And then Tim Johnson, who was the installer, who just made everything look beautiful. And then I also want to thank Roger Hankins, who first selected me to work with the Cantor Gallery. So all of these people and many other people have supported me in this project. But to talk about, if we go to the next slide, um, if we uh, are thinking about the world of the reds and grays, it's a kind of sci-fi world. So it's theatrical, and I set up the exhibition to be theatrical, but the world itself is uh, has two factions. There's the reds, which we see on the left, and they're set in the 18th century. They have the best clothes. That was one of the the exciting things about deciding to have a time bending um, world was that I could have wonderful clothes for my 18th century uh, denizens. And then the grays and their world is much less wonderful. As we can see, there's fewer things. My knitter here in the back dirt has very little um, in the way of resources, but the grays, they work and the reds have leisure. So I've set up this kind of contrasting um, universe in which the, although they interact, they are living in two different kind of milieus, if you would uh, um, be able to say it that way. And theatrically, that is something that if we go to the next slide, I think I got there because um, I studied traditional theater in Japan as an undergrad, and the work of that traditional theater was very much um, stylized, used wonderful costumes, masks, and the backgrounds were, uh, were um, stylized and allowed use of allegory and metaphor. And so this is something that I took on and I've been really amazed at myself how much of that theatrical study has in fact translated into the work I'm doing today. So the, the styles that I was most interested in when I was there were no, which is what we see on the left, the, the actor with the mask, Boonraku, which is puppets, which in this project has become a really huge part of the project, even though I'm not doing it at all in the style of the Boonraku puppets. Um, puppets. And Kabuki, if we go to the next slide. Now, this is a block print of a Kabuki actor. And he's doing this special Mie expression when there's a dramatic moment and you want to really mark it on the stage, the actor takes a stance and crosses his eyes. Well, this allows us to know this is an important point. And I love the fact that it is a stylized way of making a point. But also I like the, I showed this actor doing this via a print. So block prints were used um, during the Kabuki period. Uh, or the Tokugawa uh, period when Kabuki was rising to uh, be like the posters for the actors to talk up the shows. And so because they're multiples, this allows um, uh, a, an explosion of um, PR, so to speak. Now, one of the things that block prints also do because they're multiples is they can be politically motivated. And that's where I get into some of the stuff later using that possibility, but let's go on. I also wanna talk a little bit about my interest in Greek art and drama. This is also a highly stylized um, theater experience. And I think it, uses masks, uh, also male actors and um, uh, accompaniment with uh, music. So there's, there's certain things that 
um, respond very nicely to the Japanese stylized theater. But I think one of the things I really like about Greek drama is its social commentary and its ability to show really important issues, but it's violence, which is immense. People are always getting slaughtered in the Greek um, dramas is shown off stage. And I think having these sort of allegorical, metaphorical ways of presenting things allows perhaps an engagement of a theatrical type, which is what I'm trying to get to, that is, is a little bit removed. It's not like real life. And that's why having a sci-fi world allows me to say some things that perhaps in something that was too much just like what we see in the world today would be passed over. So next slide, please. Yeah, I just wanted to, I mean, it seems to me that one way in which these historical forms of theater um, are related to your work is that, you know, it's the stylization that you're talking about, but it's also that they adhere um, to an internal system of rules. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. And, uh, and, and I think that that's what has happened to me too. And my rules in general are um, around the characters. So the red group and the gray group, and there's all kinds of rules about how I make things and how I present them, but really it's about how the, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm having a problem with seeing everything. Um, but the, uh, using the uh, Comedia dell'arte, which was a form that uh, was um, developed in Italy and went forward into um, France in the 18th century, they used the idea of a character that one could um, use in multiple ways. It was improv. It was uh, taking a type of character and allowing one to run with it. So um, I think that's one of the really cool things about using the characters themselves as a jumping off point. I think, well, I'm looking forward to hearing more about your characters. I just wanted to make one more point about theater. Um, which is, um, it seems to me like in a distinction between the you know, theatrical genres that you're referencing um, and your own work is that theater has a, a sort of temporal element, right? Like it creates a linear narrative. Um, and I'm wondering how, because I'm sitting in your installation here, how does an installation, um, which is explored by the viewer without any temporal direction, how does it work within or and or disrupt this theatrical mode? Well, I think that's a great question because uh, actually theater today often does do disruption of a temporal mode. And I guess the experiment with this installation is there's um, many different ways you could choose to engage with it. And there's no right way. It's the cumulative, um, feeling that you get as you get acquainted with the characters, as you see their situation. Uh, here we see a scene of the Grey's camp and their, their sort of make-do um, uh, place, while in the background what they can see through the curtain is the wonderful world of the Reds. But at the same time, the Reds are looking back at the grace. So there's a, a chance for you to develop um, maybe characters you like, maybe you don't like to think of heroes or villains or situation that you would want to place yourself into. So having no direct, you know, follow the, um, the, the dotted line on the gallery floor, but something that comes to you as you engage with the show is the kind of theatrical experience that I'm trying to provide. I mean. So one of the things I made, especially for this 
show was the toy theater. And the toy theater is um, small. The characters are about nine and a half inches, which is about a half an inch shorter than the little figurines we were just looking at. And they are fit into a scene set that suits them. So the grays are shown here giving their song and dance. And yet they're in this world, this post-apocalyptic or perhaps a refugee camp, a world that doesn't seem very charming. But yet at the same time, they are um, working together to present a show. <laughs> so next slide. So another show that is shown, I, I have to say this, the whole installation is one theater little stage after another. And um, is my Santum Bank uh, performing in the palace. So on the left, we see a view of the, the puppet theater and she's, it's the Bader's puppets. And she is showing, um, she is doing a reds and grays puppet show. And then on the right, we see um, the uh, denizens of the palace. And uh, from the back, we see Vanita, who is one of my favorite characters. And she's holding her mirror because she's not really looking at the puppet show. She's enjoying the view of herself. But the um, character next, behind her is one of the greys. It's her, it's her lady in waiting or a companion who is knitting there. Um, and the interesting thing is the, the Salton Bank, who is she performing for? Because we don't see Vanita really paying much attention, but the Bader's puppets, as you begin to realize as you go through the show, um, are related to the resistance of the grace. So here is Santembank right in the middle of the palace. And she is present, presenting perhaps uh, a little bit of a show that if you really thought about it would be uh, not, not sanctioned by the reps. Next slide. Yeah, I mean, to me, before before we go into the next slide, um, you know, the this character is really interesting, um, the Salton Bank, because there's this puppet show. It sort of resonates with this idea of a kind of winking narrator, right? Who mm -hmm. has their foot in both worlds, is performing for the Reds, but really for the Greys. And there's this, you know, sort of resistant aspect to it. It reminds me a lot of. Um, you know, some of the, uh, I'm a big fan of historic satire, so that kind of all-knowing narrator is, is, you know, is often um, leads us through, you know, some of the, some of the harder parts of the story, or it helps us understand the story. Um, so I see a lot of that kind of trademark of historic satire in your work, and I, and I wonder if you, if you can talk a little bit about um, some artists or authors who have inspired you in that way. Well, um, I don't know, do we have the next slide? I can't remember who's next, might help me. Ah, Hogarth. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, Hogarth is an 18th century artist. And of course he's right in my period. And he, he did a lot of um, artistic social commentary with his, his various series and his sort of ridiculousness yet totally spot on commentary of the wealth and favor and the way the society was um, um, organized in England, I think were really exciting. So we his, see his judge. And then we also see um, uh, my versions of uh, judge, I have the, figurine who is um, 10, uh, about 10 inches tall with his staff of justice that has a skull's head on it. And then we have another version of my judge who's 42 inch high cut out uh, figurine. So um, I'm starting to play with various iterations, but I, 
I have to say about Hogarth, I've always felt that uh, he and I were twins separated at birth, even though it was 300 years apart, because we seem to have a lot of the same sensibilities about things. So next slide, please. Another artist that I um, have looked at quite a bit for this project is Watteau. He's French, he's also 18th century, but his elegant um, persons, such as who we see on the left, which you can see I totally cribbed for my uh, figure on the right, uh, was not the only thing he did when he was uh, in his, um, all his works. He, he did not only people who were uh, wealthy and elegant, but he did regular people. And that, that's just ahead of his time to be showing just the ordinary folk. He also showed war um, scenes. He was, he was somebody who was engaged with life as it was, not just how some dreamlike experience for the upper class. And I really admired that in his work. Next slide, please. Now, Voltaire must be one of my all-time favorites. He was an 18th century philosopher or writer, and the 18th century was is a great place to put my reds because it was a powerful century when we look back on it. One of revolution and one of the idea of human rights coming to the forefront. So a lot of things were going on there. Um, Wealth was very wealthy. It was um, the European countries used um, their ability to uh, colonize places and to use slave labor to create an enormous amount of wealth while people on the bottom were doing the work and um, often were not in a very good situation. So right there, we have the notion of the reds and the grays but I want it in my world to be a little broader. So my grays actually are a little less um, set into a particular time. But I have to talk about Candide because it was like a sci-fi story in which Candide, a, a, an innocent, he's, he's, he's very gullible. He has all these adventures and then after he goes through them all, he's still casting about what is the meaning of life? And he runs across a farmer. And this farmer says to him that he um, tends 20 acres with his family. And that this work keeps at bay three evils. And these are boredom, vice, and need. And this was like an electric shock for Candide. So he goes back and he convinces his uh, friends who have had many of the adventures with him that that is what they need to do. They need to tend their garden. So this upper class man suddenly realized that having a purpose is important. Next slide. Great, so I think, you know, the, um, you know, thinking about these big literary influences, um, you know, the big, big ideas and he's taking these big ideas that you're thinking, you know, you're sort of working with into account. Um, how do you and sort of shift into the world that you're creating, the characters that you're creating, um, you know, these big themes of income, social disparity, um, is that's an, that's an endemic problem, um, but it's also a local problem. So, you know, how do you work to build a world that is, um, so sort of big and applicable, but also meaningful and meaningfully specific, just like you know these big satires do. What's, how do you get your characters to do that? Well, part of it is in the details. Okay. I like, um, but each of the characters, um, what's the next slide maybe? Ah, uh, each of the characters has, um, in general, a talisman or the way they wear their clothes that says something about them. And so that allows like in the Commedia dell'arte, you 
understand immediately who they are. Um, and so here we have Vanita and she's holding her mirror. So she's always, um, she has her Marie Antoinette hairdo there. And um, what these kinds of talismans and details, and remember most of the world is tiny. Most of the figures are small. You have to, it's like a, a dollhouse. You have to get in close to see it. It allows me to be, and this is a term that Hogarth used, a visual dramatist. And so I can use a number of different ways to play with the characters, including um, uh, video, which I think is the most uh, inclusive of all the media I work with. But all of the characters generally get built up in very, um, various recursive ways so that as I get to know them, they begin to almost create their own narrative. I don't tell them what to do. They tell me what to do. Next. So here we have this um, abstracted world. Um, I, I want the, hopefully, that the visitor sees um, something to get excited about in the characters themselves, but not to give them so much um, verisimilitude that they don't have room for their own imagination. So the hauler here, who is one of the gray characters, he wears his tin pot head, hat, just like the, all the gray men do. And he's dressed in his, um, it's almost a uniform, uh, gray outfit. Uh, I guess I would have to say it is a uniform and he's hauling along, hauling along Benita. So he's pulling that weight uh, as she's enjoying her mirror, of course. Next, please. So here we have a couple of uh, versions where we're seeing uh, backdrops with uh, Dandy and Benita. And Dandy is a very proud man. He dresses well. And here we can see the red and gold paper that the reds, all their outfits are made out of this. But the delightfulness is that all their outfits are really special to them. So I have a lot of fun um, creating what I think will prop up the character that I'm making in the reds. Next slide. Before we move on, I just want to point out the tiny portrait that oh. you've painted. <laughs> Dandy in the background. Um, and so, you know, that's a, it's a hard thing to, to capture some of, you know, what, what you're talking about in terms of this iterative world. Um, but that's, you know, the, the sort of entering into it and seeing all of these little details um, where, you know, Dandy is, has a portrait, a tiny portrait of himself inside his, you know, his little, um, you know, dressing area or, or whatever. Um, these are, th this is some of the, the sort of infinite delight that you get from experiencing these little stage sets. Oh, thank you. And, and, and then we see, I also make portraits of um, the various characters. And here's a, a not quite so tiny. The one in the last slide is maybe an inch and a half or two inches square, but this is five inch um, um, uh, on a side uh, wash portrait. And um, I've made the gouache portraits and the block prints all small, sort of to relate to this tininess of the world. But on the right, we see a video still. Now, what's fun at the gallery, we have the video, it takes up an entire wall. So instead of having these tiny figurines, all of a sudden they're blown up large and they feel entirely different, I think, at that scale. And we see on the right, we see one of the bully boys. So he's a gray. We see he has the same outfit, except he gets a red sash, a brown belt, and a club. Because, of course, the reds, there are very few of them and many grays. They have to keep order. So some of the grays have um, taken a job as uh, the order keepers. Next slide. 
Now here's um, the character we saw uh, back at the palace when Sultan Bank, the puppeteer was presenting. This is the knitter and this is a gouache view of her. And if we go on to the next slide, I wanna talk just for a moment about uh, her. Uh, the knitter uh, is, um, it's a miniature. She's, her knitting needles are about an inch long but she really has, she's really knitted that, except it was really me that knitted that. And I didn't know how to knit before I started to make this character, but I really wanted her to knit. Um, and so I crammed in how to do it in about a week because I'm not particularly clever at this kind of thing. And um, was successful in miniaturizing the knitting. And now if you were to ask me, to knit something, I would have to say, I wouldn't have the foggiest idea. It was like cramming for an exam and then forgetting it all. I'm sure I could learn it again, but uh, it's sort of interesting to me. Sometimes when I study up something for this project, it's, it's a really specific thing and then it gets part of the project, but I don't always retain the knowledge that I had when I did it. <laughs> Here's another uh, video still. And I, one of the things um, that was exciting about uh, having this show at the gallery was I was able to show all five parts of my uh, video series, The Red Baiters. And this is from the prologue. And here we see another view of uh, Dandy and Benita. And they're... Um, situated in a background I have, I took in Germany, but it was, their figures were uh, set against a green screen. So I could um, make that transparent, the, the background, you could take away the green screen and then you can put in anything you want. Next slide. And another version of Saltenbank, the puppeteer. And she is also performing once again in the palace in one of the videos. Next slide. And here she is um, in a gouache painting and she's um, holding uh, one of the hand puppets. And I think one of the things that fascinates me about the puppeteer is that in a sense, I am the puppeteer of this entire project. And I, when I developed the miniature puppet stage that we have seen a couple of versions of, I fell in love with it. I really liked the idea of the stage. So then I had to make a full scale size one. And uh, so here we see uh, her as the 10 and a half inch figure then we see the full eight foot tall stage in which I can step behind and manipulate the puppets. And then I made a little puppet video that uh, accompanies the show. So it just gets layers upon layers upon layers. But I think that's what fascinates me about creating this world. Next. I'm just gonna interject for a second and say, um, what you're looking at are installation shots in the gallery just so you know what you're seeing. But then this the video that Bridget has created of the puppet show is uploaded to the website. So you can actually watch the video um, of this, the show taking place. And there are numerous videos on the, on the site that um, are part of the, both within the show, but then have their own external life on that website. Right, so that the five um, videos I created about the red bit, baiters are all presented and they're all about three minutes long. So you can watch one or all of them in not very much time. Okay, I just thought it would be interesting to show a little bit about my working process, um, how I make the small uh, little figures because they're the ones that jumpstart everything. And they, I have given myself um, rules about how to do this. I don't use um, traditional um, uh, modeling materials, but I think that allows me to create 
I don't want to create a perfect doll. I want to create a motive puppet, so to speak, or a figure that has um, uh, is not perfect, just like none of us are perfect. And so if we see a wire armature that then gets wrapped in tissue paper and tape. Next slide. And then it gets more details and we can see a little bit of uh, the drawing that I, I do. I start with drawings of what I want the pose to be. And as the figure gets uh, more developed, I begin putting on um, modeling paste and more paper to get the details. Next slide. Until I begin to actually start to paint the, the uh, character. And then if we go to the next slide, we can see that I'm beginning to dress them. Now, um, we see the, the figure has um, all its detail in its face, but then underneath, uh, I've created sort of patterns just like you would if you were doing a dress pattern for the grays because it's the same all the time. So it was much easier to actually have a pattern and just utilize it over and over again. And then because I'm not sewing these, I'm gluing these, um, they're put together in a non-traditional way as you can kind of see on the right-hand side. Next slide. And then here we have the finished character digger, except he doesn't have his, his tin pot on his head yet. But, um, and then we have him, much like my toy theater, we have the musician and digger, they're singing in front of their hovel there in what might be a cage or a camp, uh, but yet they are not daunted which I like about the grays. They're not daunted. Next slide. Um, before we get there, I just want to ask, I mean, I think the next slide is, is, is a video still. Um, mm -hmm. the, the digger in the video still, and you see him you know, singing here too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, one, one thing I find interesting is that, you know, we're here in this space, we have these, you know, tableaus, these, you know, small theaters, big theaters, um, and, you know, one question I you know, sort of started with, with this, you know, wanting to ask you was, you know, you've set up all of this sort of ambiguity um, and the, the sort of lack of, of temporal structure, and then you went to video from there. So um, what, what goal does the video uh, serve? What, what goal does the video fulfill in this project for you? Well, first of all, it's the most immersive. It allows me to, to uh, have the characters interact e either through animation or um, st um, stop action or, or movement in backgrounds that I've put together that are specially for whatever scene I'm working on. And the, I had always wanted to do video from the very beginning, but you need a certain critical mass of characters to be able to start to put together anything that would at all have uh, narrative aspirations. And um, one of the things that I've enjoyed about doing this video is I'm not really, there's a narrative, but you have to sort of discover it on your own because it's the it doesn't have traditional dialogue that most of the sound is um, a soundscape it's a, a th something i've made that uh, creates an emotional uh, situation and there's a few placards they're like silent films and uh, some of the there's one or two things where i have um, um, a song that i've composed that is inserted in there, but it's mostly you move along by the way the sound kind of drags us forward and whether it's uh, nice or it's disturbing. And I think that the video allows me to show both of those things. Next, please. So here we have one of the magical characters. There's a couple of characters within the project that are part animal, 
and part human. And both of them have really big teeth. And I don't know what that means exactly, but um, they are powerful. And in one of the videos, Gray Days, they both seem to be in charge of their factions. So Wolfman is um, holding up his book and rallying the Grays. And I think the next slide, um, oh, we have another version of him. We could see his book better and a graphic uh, representation of that. But if we go forward yet again, there we see um, the vizier or horseman. And he's the um, obviously a magical strong man for the reds. And he's set in this kind of golden light. And I have to say, the Vizier was the first character I created. There was something about him, his magicalness and his teeth that got me. And that's how the project got started. Next slide. Okay, here we have um, an aeronaut who's a red. And the 18th century was the beginning of uh, the balloonist age. But what I find uh, interesting about the aeronaut is he's, he is different than most of the Reds. He seems to have some purpose. He's doing something. He, maybe what he's doing is for leisure. Maybe it's for science. Maybe it's for spying. We don't know, but he's actually actively engaged. Next slide, please. So here's a, a view of a, a, a an early balloon in the late 18th century. And uh, that was some of the inspiration I used for making my balloon. Next slide. Here we have a close up of the aeronaut. And as I say, uh, he's above it all. So somehow he's outside of the direct, um, the reds and the grays. He has some kind of viewpoint that is different. Next slide. And we see him flying along the coast. And so he, he gets uh, view, all kinds of views uh, as he flies around. Next slide. The aeronaut was one of the ones that I thought might just be you. <laughs> the one who, see, who's, who sees it all. Right? Yeah, well, it, yeah, it's sort of analogous to Sultan Bank in a sense, yeah. And then um, one of the things that I created in the videos is a sense of resistance. And I talked about that a little bit with Sontem Bank. And so here's the graffiti. Every good resistance needs graffiti. Moving on. And that gets us to why maybe I am so exercised about this whole thing. When we look at our society, we see that the United States the CEOs who are the princes of our society, in a sense, make 350 times more than the average worker. And we see this is way larger than most other countries. And so this worry about income inequality in our country and how this um, imbalance may affect our democracy as uh, the very few hold so many more recess, resources than uh, the large portion of the population and how that can create um, problems. Next slide. So here we have um, one of my gray characters. He's alone, he's walking in a, a sort of, gray area and this is not particularly this is kind of lonely and sad and maybe it might be interesting to think about when you're looking at the show what you might like to think would happen in this world how you would like to organize it would do you like the way it is do you want to change it do you want to be the reds do you want to be the grays and um, that's one of the questions I'm asking with the show. Next slide. And here we have a picture of Anita once again. She is looking in her mirror. That's what she sees is herself. 
And this is a problem in our society. We all tend to live in bubbles and we're not necessarily looking outwardly. And um, maybe that's not the best thing for us. Next slide. And so we, I end with the idea of trying to ask ourselves, who are we? What do we want to be? Where do we want to go? Where, what, what does our society need for us to uh, be more comfortable and just in this world? So I think that's all I have to say, but I thank everybody for listening. Great, thank you, Bridget. So um, I'm gonna you know, encourage you to write questions into the Q&A. Um, I just want to quickly say, you know, thank you to Bridget for um, giving us a view into your process. It's, you know, to me very fascinating. And I have, you know, I have some, I have some other questions that I that didn't fit into this hour, but I'm, I'm going to keep, I'm going to see if I have a chance to ask them. Um, other people should have a chance to ask questions too. Um, and I'm really appreciative of the way that you, you know, been transparent about um, you know, your inspirations and how you you know, have sort of come to gather you know, these inspirations into your particular point of view. Um, so I do see um, some questions popping up and um, I'm gonna start with one um, and then yeah, we have Paula here too. Um, Paula's gonna have some, her eye on the Q&A. So feel free to, to type anything into that. Um, but I see a good question from Professor again um, and her eagle eye in looking at the videos and some of the stills um, she says, you know, we've heard about some of the textual theatrical inspiration. Can you comment on the architectural inspiration? Um, do you use any specific French buildings, um, buildings in general that, that, um, that have served to form some of the backgrounds for your, for your movie? That is a great question because that's been one of the pleasures. Even before I began making the video, I began taking photographs of as I traveled around to situate my reds and my grays. And <clears throat> I, it's been a lot of fun to take uh, pictures in museums, in, on the street. And I, 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 what I want is to capture the lushness, baroqueness of the 18th century world for the reds. And the for the grays, the, the sort of bleak or make do attitude. And so that's what those um, shots that I put in the background are from. And then I often manipulate them. They're not exactly as they were taken, they've been filtered or um, maneuvered to create the, the emotional resonance that I want. Bridget, I see another question from Ashley Bannon. She says, given your theatrical background, why did you choose to create a multimedia exhibit instead of a play? Instead of what? A play. Oh, because I'm not a playwright. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I, I'm not really a writer. I'm a visual artist and playing around with, that's why the term visual dramatist that Hogarth used seems like a really perfect one for me because it allows me to play around with all these uh, various dramatic scenes and tropes, but yet I am spared having to write a play. <laughs> I have a follow-up to that, Bridget, which is, um, you know, thinking about, you know, you write, you write the scripts, you write the music, you perform the puppet shows, you make the puppets, you make everything. And it, it occurred to me at one point to ask you if you've ever thought about collaborating ever with anybody, or is it really, is it essential that it all comes from you? Well, I think for this project at this point, it's kind of baked in that that would be more likely that it would continue as something I would make. But um, I wouldn't be um, adverse to working with somebody um, in developing something that would be its own thing. Um, I mean, I haven't had that opportunity much to work with anybody, um, but it would be an exciting adventure. <laughs> We have another question from Professor Michael Beatty. Can you tell us more about your undergraduate learning? Did you travel to Japan? 
Uh, yes, I traveled to Japan. I lived there about a year and a half, mostly in Kyoto. And, and in Kyoto, the no theater was, um, they had, that's what I looked at there. And then um, Osaka, which was not very far away, was where I uh, would travel and um, saw the Bunraku and the Kabuki theaters. That's where those, those were presented. I also managed to get myself an English teaching job in Osaka. So when, when over, I could earn a little money before I would watch a play, which was a good thing when you're a student. So. Uh, Bridget, I have a question from, um, from Susan Schmidt, Professor Susan Schmidt. Mm -hmm. And the question is, you know, within the Reds, do the characters have different attitudes towards the grays? You know, is, are they con conscious of their own self-privilege? I mean, how individualized are they? I think that changes. And that changes every time I make a new character. Like um, I now have, um, first time ever, the writer has, has uh, taken the stage on um, this show. And I'm beginning to think about him uh, in a different way, in the way he may uh, interact with the Greys as I move forward. Um, I have to say, Vanita is pretty much always self-absorbed, and so is Dandy. But um, some of the other characters may, in fact, have different kind of relationships. Not always good in one of the videos the judge is sentencing uh, one, the hauler to, it seems like execution or at least prison. So there's not necessarily um, always a good interaction, but um, they, it, it's capable of having different interactions depending on the scene set I come up with. We have a question from Kerry Bresnahan. What made you choose a horse and a wolf as leaders of the factions? Well, both of those are pretty mythical characters. I mean, the wolf and the horse have a lot of resonance. And um, frankly, when I begin a project, I don't really know what I'm doing. They, that horseman came out I, I don't know where he came from. Um, and then the wolfman kind of came out and then then I go forward. I, 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 I find sometimes inspiration is mysterious. I just give myself um, the permission to do it. And if it's a failure, I don't have to show it to anybody. <laughs> but it's it's something, you know, by saying no too early to yourself as an artist, you don't get anywhere. And so I've had lots of things that I would hardly say were terrific when I began working on them. But, uh, you know, as you proceed and do things and persist and create a world like this, things happen. Right, and I think one of the things that comes across in this installation is just the pure delight that you have in creating and recreating over and over again. I do, I do, I must say, it's a lot of play. And um, I mean, why would I wanna spend so much time on something unless I was getting enjoyment out of it? And uh, they manipulate me and I manipulate them, I think. Um, I have a question from Brian Goslow. How has having the video component allowed you to explain your vision to viewers and to bring it to life? Well, I think it's because it's more immersive than any of the other media that I'm using. I mean, well, actually the show is pretty immersive, but if you were to just see singular um, explorations of the project, like a 2D version or one of the figurines, you really wouldn't get the idea of the uh, world building that I've done. And so I think the video um, gives me that immersive experience, allows me to use the architecture that somebody was mentioning, allows me to use music as an emotional punch or soundscape, because a lot of it is just 
piling up of sound, but it it's it in some way feels the most um, complete of all the media. So when I want to perhaps introduce the project to somebody, a video will give the shorthand of the entire project better than anything else, I think. Great. Uh, Virginia Regan uh, has another comment. Fascinating juxtaposition of sources for costuming of the grays. Concentration camp pajamas, Chinese cultural uh, revolution uniform forms, mental institution dress. Is this oh, those are excellent. <laughs> this deliberate, she wants to know. I, I think you captured that. Yeah. Well, I, it's been really interesting how people comment. And I've had um, uh, several of those comments um, mentioned about the Gray's outfit, but I hadn't really thought about it in that kind of global sense when I began creating. I just wanted something that was very plain and uh, but ridiculous too. that tin pot on the head hardly is something that would one call high fashion, you know, so um, it, it, it's kind of developed because all of the characters are wearing these outfits that it becomes all those references that she mentioned. And I think they're excellent. Or he mentioned, I'm sorry, I didn't catch. I have a question from Renee Lynch. So um, I think this is a, a I'm gonna bring it home kind of question, but I have a couple more. So can you speak about the resonance to our current moment in your, mo in your images of the grays and cages vis-a-vis -vis immigrants and the wolf man brandishing the book vis-a-vis -vis Trump and his Bible brandishing during the Black, Black Lives Matter protest in DC? Uh, Rainey, you're, you're, you're putting me on the spot here. Um, these are definitely good. It was weird when I created the notion of the cages um, for the project. That was before the immigrants were put in the cages. And it, so it kind of gave me an awful chill when uh, those children were installed because it's almost like I thought it into being, and of course that's ridiculous, but the fact that the world is, that I'm creating so is so reflective of things that we are seeing in our own society is um, frightening, but also allows a resonance that perhaps if these things weren't happening, uh, people wouldn't think about some of the things I'm doing in quite the same way. So I think we're just about out of time. Um, I'm gonna, you know, take the opportunity to ask the last question. Um, <laughs> um, something that I, I'm really interested in hearing about. So, um, you know, I do find, and I, and you know, the thing I keep finding uh, unique about your work is um, is the capacity that you give it to be so generative that you sort of allow it to go where where it wants to go. Um, and sometimes I feel like you've almost brought the project to completion. Um, and then you've pushed past the end to another end to another end um, again and again. And so um, I think I'd like to hear you answer the question of, you know, have you ever set a limit on this world of reds and grays? You know, is there, is there a final, is there a finitude um, to the project? You know, something that you're hoping to, to accomplish, to get to, um, and how will you know when you're there? That is something, I don't know, I keep finding, like you say, it just keeps kind of growing. And um, I'm not, it doesn't feel like it's done yet. And I am I have a whole series of books I've made for this project, for example, that we only have one example at the show. And I can't think that I won't come up with other ways that I want to play with this project. Um, so no, I can't say where it's going to end. I, it, part of it is because it does reflect society. It's pretty hard to stop because I keep feeling that there's something more to say. Great. Well, we are so appreciative um, that you've been on this journey with us during this bizarre fall. 
Um, it has been, you know, a light for us to have you here in the gallery installing, and we have, you know, appreciated that you've gone through, you know, these sort of different levels of videos and building the, the, the website um, and trying to, you know, really think through what it means to be both a show that's in the gallery and also um, online. And so I'm, I'm deeply appreciative of, of your willingness to, to take that journey with us. Um, I do want to say to everyone that you can come see the show. We're, we're open Tuesday through Friday, noon to five, um, by appointment only. So you have to contact us. And I had a slide that went at the end that has disappeared. Um, but Paul is going to fill in our phone number. 508-793-3356. <laughs> Notice that I don't remember numbers very well. So give us a call, email Paula, email me, and we will make an appointment for you to come into the gallery. Um, and we would love to see you here. So thank you so much for joining us today. Visit the website, come see the show. Um, and we look forward to seeing you, you know, online, in person. Um, and thanks again, Bridget, for joining us today. Well, thank you. It has been wonderful to have this opportunity to talk to everyone.